Good morning. Um, if you would, let's uh, let's uh, let's turn to uh, to start with. Get two passages. We'll just get Second Corinthians five to start with. Um, as you know, we've been talking about this series now about ambassadorship. I think this is the tenth study. Uh, we started out establishing our heavenly our heavenly conversation and our earthly ambassadorship. We talked about Satan's. Uh, uh, policy of evil against the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace. We talked about how he wants to oppose the truth. We looked at the threefold strategy of attack the message, attack the messenger, discourage and discredit the messenger. And then we spent three weeks looking at some things about or related to uh, the ministry of reconciliation and making sure that we understand uh, what that is and what that's about. And then the last two Sundays, we've been sort of working our way slowly into the issue of evangelism. Uh, we looked at the issue of the gifts um, in Ephesians 4, kind of the last two Sundays. We've discussed some things about um, Timothy and, and uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 about uh, doing the work of an evangelist and some of what that means. Um, I just want to share with you 2 Corinthians 5, verse... Uh, <clears throat> 17. Oh, and then I also clarified some of the pronouns here last week. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So um, we, we, we went through that passage. We've been through it just about every Sunday, almost, that we've been in this series since the beginning of the year. Um, it, a thought occurred to me, though, that I just want to share with you about what some are saying about this passage. If you remember to a few weeks ago, I was using the term the forgiven lost. Remember that? To, but it's really, it's really the forgiven and reconciled unrighteous. That's what they're believing in, right? If you're going to believe and teach that all of the world is already forgiven and reconciled, but they're not justified, then you're, they're really maintaining the belief in the forgiven and reconciled unrighteous. Um, let me just say, when I said that this past week in social media, that was not received well. Um, but I think the reason for that is when you say it like that, you're really highlighting what that position is actually saying. Okay. So as we think about evangelism, what I want to do to start today... Uh, is I want to kind of brainstorm some stuff here and get some stuff on the board. So I, before we look at any verses or discuss anything specific, I just want to hear from you guys. Like, what, are, what do you guys think are some uh, event, uh, roadblocks or reasons why believers don't um, maybe share their faith like maybe they otherwise wish they would or could or even should? So what are some what are some some reasons why believers are are uh, skittish when it comes to the issue of ambassadorship? I think the multiple views of uh, the different churches in Christianity cause uh, a lot of confusion. So I'm going to say different doctrine. Yes. Is it two F's and different? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yes. All right, good. Different doctrine. What, any other reasons you can think of why believers are maybe skittish or apprehensive to do this? I just think the main thing is the fear of a negative response. And, uh, okay. Maybe they think they don't have enough information. So, what do you mean by that, Ernie? They don't have, uh, they might know it themselves, but to be able to explain it to somebody else, they're a little bit fearful of saying it correctly. So, lack of information, um, unsure, uh, how... Explain it, I'm, I'm sure, 
might get thrown a question that they, they don't have. Yeah, confidence. Okay, so can we say lack of confidence? Yes. All right, anything else come to mind? I think hostility. Sometimes when I go ahead and, and talk to people about my relationship with the Lord, um, they like to point out, are you better than me, or all this, or what makes you say that? They're kind of hostile, too. Yeah. So hostility toward yeah, um, the believer? I think so. Sharing the message? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Concept of sin. What do you, what, what do you mean? The concept of sin. Not, uh, in, I guess, uh, a lot of the modern, uh, especially younger generations, the whole concept of ultimately there is this and it is for sure sin. Whereas, you know, a lot of things are getting compromised nowadays. So that, that ultimate authority of what sin really is. So I'm going to say absolute nature of truth. That's really what that's about, right? Right. The Bible says that man is sinful, right? And so absolute nature of truth um, questioned in modern culture, right? All right? I think that's possibly another one. Maybe, maybe there's a lack of feeling like knowing how to handle that. Okay, anything else come to mind? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, they've got so much uh, distractions that they don't have time to think about or to place their faith in the Lord because they're busy with what's going on in their life. So is that what is that keeping you from doing it, or is that keeping them from listening? I, I want to. I, okay. I think for me it's, it's both because you know you're going to be you know. It's like the blank stare of the deer in the headlights when you talk to a teenager sometimes. It's like, I don't, I don't know anything about no. that. <laughs> yeah, they can't put down their phone long enough to talk to them. <coughs> anything else come to mind? I think that's a pretty good list so far. This is, uh, I don't want to cut it off if somebody has another uh, thought they want to share regarding this. Well, I think that one thing we talked about, but I think some of it is actually you're, you're afraid that they're going to reject so fear of personal rejection yeah all right good I think that's true I, th I think you could also maybe make the argument that when they reject this, we take it, right. and it probably goes both ways, maybe. Okay, Any, anybody else? Um, sometimes there's a lack of, on the presenter of a uh, reflective listening type, so that you're not giving them the information or approaching it, no matter they may receive it. So... Approach or technique, I guess, would be... Um, Poor approach. Yeah. So, can you tell me a little bit more what you're thinking there, Sean? Well, I, I, I've been presented a few different times, and and it almost seems like they're you're so set on presenting it in a certain way that if somebody doesn't respond in the way you're expecting, um, oh, it really okay, can throw you off or it can throw them off. I I know what you're talking about. I think a lot of uh, I think that a lot of the um, very uh, structured evangelistic approaches are very you memorize certain things and then if somebody responds to you outside of the what you've memorized you don't know what to say uh, I think that could be a, a factor anything else you can think of I think that's a pretty good list somebody take a picture of that with your phone if you would uh, before we leave so uh, was that, but anything else we could add there how about this, this, how about this one? Someone else will do it.
All right, so let's look at a few things, okay? So what I want to, I basically want to go over, uh, I basically have two things essentially that I want to talk about uh, in this lesson as we start to kind of get more to a practical approach to this. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is why reasons believers don't witness for Christ or we, reasons believers don't um, take ambassadorship maybe uh, as seriously as they should or are, or are, or are not doing uh, maybe... See, I don't even like saying it like that, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Reasons believers don't speak up more or witness. You, we've actually come up here with a bunch with some stuff that I didn't really even think of when I made a list. I made a list of about four or five things here, okay? Uh, the first one I had, go to Ephesians 5. The first one I had was um, sort of the idea of lethargy, right? The idea of, well, you know, somebody else will take care of this for me. Um, Ephesians 5, verse 14. Verse 13, he says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for uh, whatsoever doth make manifest is light. But then look at verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. He's talking there to the Ephesians. He's talking there to believers. And he, and he likens them to basically being what? Asleep. Asleep, right? They're believers, but are they just sort of sleepwalking through their life as a believer, right? They, they, they are believers. They've trusted the finished work. They're good with it. They're secure in that understanding and that knowledge, but they're sort of not redeeming the time. Look at verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Okay? So the idea of redeeming the time is the idea that obviously time is not... We don't, none of us have an uh, infinite amount of time here on earth to be an ambassador. The idea of not being asleep, okay? And I think that believers, uh, I know, look, I'll be the first to admit this about myself, right? It's easy to make excuses. It's easy to say, well, you know, I'll get around to it whenever I get around to it or whatever. And so you, you don't say anything, Okay. So I think that could be a factor, the idea, of, the idea of, of, of lethargy, being asleep, not taking ambassadorship and evangelism seriously. That could, be a, that could be a possibility. Second, I have down a general category that I have some of the stuff under. Okay, and The category that I have is believing the enemy's lies. Okay, So underneath that I have mind your own business. You don't have the right to force your views on others. That's kind of this stuff right here about no absolute what. So who are you to tell me that I'm a sinner? Who are you to tell me that the only way to heaven is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't you know that I am, uh, don't you know that I'm an American and I can believe whatever I want? And you're being closed minded and dogmatic and, you know, you're being uh, exclusive and all that sort of stuff. If you're going to tell me that the only way that I can get to heaven is by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, you got to, we got to face facts, right? Our claims are very exclusive, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? Me, Me right? So there is no other way. Muhammad is not going to get it done. Buddha is not going to get it done. Krishna is not going to get it done. None other, no other religious system or figure is going to be able to accomplish the salvation and justification of a lost man. The only person that did that was Christ, right? So one of the enemy's lies is, or lies, excuse me, is mind your own business. You have no right to force your views on other people. That one works really well in modern day American culture. Where, you, where you're just supposed to be, you know, tolerant of everyone's view. But tolerant in the sense of accepting all views as equally true. You have to understand that the word tolerance, that the, word, the meaning of that has been changed in modern culture. That word no longer means respecting somebody's right to believe what they want. That view now means you have to accept everyone's belief as equally what? True. True. Okay. Which logically is not possible, right? So if Jesus says that I'm God, he either is God or he isn't God, right? 
if the Jewish religion and the Islamic religion, if they want, do they agree with Christianity about who Jesus was? The Jewish faith the, the, and the Islamic religion, they don't believe Jesus was God. Right? Isn't it a fundamental tenet of, of Christianity that Jesus was God, the second member of the Godhead, incarnate in human flesh, died on the cross, paid for sin, rose from the dead? Those are pretty important things, right? Okay? So can they all be true? So don't fall for this sort of false tolerance type of concept, okay? Another enemies, another under the category of believing the enemy's lies is the idea of, well, you're just going to offend people. Too bad. Right? You're just going to, if you tell them the truth about their sin, you're just going to offend them. Third, people will think you are a fanatic or crazy. So I think that's... Fear of negative responses. I think that it's also fear of personal what? Rejection. Right? The idea that, well, if I do this, they're going to think I'm nuts. They're going to think I'm crazy. Okay? Four. People will say no, and I will be embarrassed. Fear of negative what? Response. <coughs> Five. Maybe, maybe they'll get mad and not be friends with me anymore. Fear of negative what? Response. Fear of personal rejection. Okay? And then, I, then the third cat, so I think I've got a lot of these general concepts on my list, but I have them under the sort of the broader heading of believing the enemy's lies. Okay? Look, if you really love someone, do you care more about, and this is what we have to think through and get over, right? Do we care more about the eternal state of that person? Or do we care more about how, what, how they're going to respond to us now? Yeah, that's the... See, that's the, that's the rub, right? The eternal, whatever, whatever the, that spiritual condition of that person is, that's going to last for eternity, a little bit of discomfort and whatever for us now is probably going to be temporary and it's certainly not going to last for eternity, right? So the enemy has these lies that he puts out there that believers, you know, that we listen to, that we hear in our, in our that, that self-talk that you do in your own mind, you know what I'm saying? That where you are, oh, I'm not sure, and you're doing all that sort of thing, that's all part of that in my opinion, Okay. Then I've got my third general category is what I called lack of know-how or not knowing how to do it, right? So we've got, this might fit there. Well, what do you do when you encounter different doctrine? We've got lack of information, not sure how to explain it. We've got lack of confidence on the board. Okay, we've got poor approach. So we've got some of these things on here. So my third general category was lack of know-how. And what I had, I had two things under here. I had don't know what to say or how to start a conversation so we don't say anything. Okay? And then second I have, this is one of the main issues. Well, And then second I have things about um, lack of information, lack of confidence, not sure what to do. Sometimes I think you also, this is just my opinion, you can disagree if you want, but there are, there are, I think you have to be strategic with the people you know. There are some people in my life that I'm taking more of a longer view with respect to, okay, where I'm talking to them about certain things and I'm slowly, I'm slowly moving into a conversation with them about their eternal state, okay, then there's other people that I'm just up front with them about that issue, right? So I, 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 don't, I don't mean to say here in this, what we're doing, that there's one right and one wrong way to do this, okay? I think as an ambassador and as a member of the Church of the Body of Christ, you have liberty to approach the, search, the situation and the circumstance the way that you think is the best way to approach it. But, I, but, that, but in doing that, not doing anything, is, as far as my understanding of Paul, is really not an option. It's really not an option we, can, we should consider, 
Okay, if I could say it that way. So we've got spiritual lethargy. We've got believing the enemy's lies. We've got lack of know-how. And then my, my fourth one, and I think the single biggest reason people don't personally witness and become active soul winners is because of fear. Okay? So we have that up there at least two or three different times. Okay? Come with me over to 1 Timothy 7. I mean, chapter 1, verse 7. <laughs> it's that time change, Ron. You're, you're, you're missing that hour, okay? I could say anything I want to and sneak anything in, and nobody would know this morning. 1 Timothy 1. Uh, look, look, with, um, look with me at verse uh, 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, neither understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Okay? Now, you have to get through your head right at the beginning that you are going to encounter people, as Sean said, that have no clue. They don't know the truth. They have all these ideas about who and what God is, about what salvation is, how salvation works. They're going to think that they, they play a role in it. They're going to have all sorts of ideas, okay? And the lost and the church, if you will. The guy, who's, the guy who's going to a church who's never trusted the finished work of Christ, he's going to have certain things that he thinks, certain pre, preconceptions and whatever that he has in his mind. And then a lost man, an unchurched guy who's never been to church at all, he's going to have a whole other set of what? Ideas. ideas and thoughts and so forth in his mind, right? So Paul's saying here, desiring to be teachers of the law, neither understanding, uh, uh, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. They have no idea. They're going to have no idea what they're saying or where they're getting their information from. So if you have a command of the scripture, do you have an advantage before you even start? You have a knowledge advantage before you even start. And I'm going to say more about that in a minute, okay? But the thing, we think about fear. Paul says, for we have not been given the spirit of what? Fear. Fear, okay? So there's three things that I want you to consider about fear. Okay, number one. Fear is rational. You have an emotion called fear that sometimes serves you well. Yeah, I mean if I decided to chuck you in a pit of snakes, you're probably going to have some what? Fear, and the fear that you have is part of a self-preservation mechanism to get out of danger, right? So in, some, in certain situations, is fear a normal thing? Yep. If somebody came in here, by all means, you know, threatening us or doing something crazy, uh, you would have a sense of what? Fear, fear right? So fear is, a, fear is a natural part of you as a person that you are going to have to figure out how you're going to deal with what? With, with, with fear and the situation, right? Now, that being said, fear can be what? I think fear could be sin if it paralyzes you from doing what you ought to do. Think of all the believers through history who were who are given the option of either recant your faith and live or don't recant and we'll chuck you to the lions or we'll tie you to a stick and burn you or we'll drown you in the river or whatever other th god awful thing they come up with to do to you. 
right? Peter says to the Pharisees in the book of Acts, he says, are we to obey you over who? God. God. Right? The other thing about fear is that fear is a constant. You think Paul was ever totally got over fear? I don't. I don't think he ever totally got over it. So if we think about if we think about these things, fear is rational. Fear can be a sin. Fear is a constant. That means do we have to develop some skills and some strategies for how we're going to deal with this. If this is the single biggest reason why we're not being ambassadors and why believers don't share their faith and so on and so forth is because of fear of negative response, fear, fear of personal rejection, and these sorts of things, we've got to think through, okay, how are we going to deal with fear? Okay, how are we going to... We're, we're going to have to have a strategy then for dealing with it, right? So I'm going to... Who, is this from Sunday school? I'm just going to remind me to move this or put it back up when we're done. Okay. So, let's talk about some stuff about. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter. So the the first. So I'm gonna. We're gonna make an acronym here about how to deal with fear. First, we have the first way to deal with fear is to realize that we need to have faith in what the message that we have is the power of God and salvation. Okay, I'm not the power of God and the salvation. You're not the power of God and the salvation. The power of God and the salvation is in the gospel. The gospel of Christ. Okay? So if, if, if we go in understanding and we have faith in the message, this is the message that saved you. When you believe this message, this took you out of Adam and put you where? Into Christ, right? So the first way to deal with fear is to have faith in the message. To have confidence that it has the power and the capacity to save the sinner. Okay? To take him out of Adam and to put him where? In the Christ, right? Romans chapter 1. <coughs> Romans chapter... Uh, I'm in Jeremiah. What am I doing? Sorry. Hang on. <laughs> I was way off. It's that it's lack of sleep, Ron. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not, what? Ashamed. That's a good verse about fear, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right? So Paul, Paul's not ashamed. He, Paul's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's not ashamed of the message. He's not ashamed of what he's saying because he understands that in that message is the power of God unto what? Salvation. Okay? No other goofy thing that anybody's going to come up with over here is going to be the power of God unto salvation. I don't care what religious figure said it. I don't care what, how many you know, letters they have behind their name or any of that kind of thing. The power of God unto salvation is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? So we have faith in... And I messed it up. When did I do that? We have faith in the message. Okay? Do you understand that you, when you confidently sit, share that with somebody, okay, when you confidently share the message of Christ with somebody, you are incredibly, you are an incredibly dynamic person when you confidently share the power of God and the salvation. You are giving that lost person something that they've never had or they've never seen before. Okay, so the first way to deal with fear is faith 
in the message. Now, also, look at verse 15. Paul says, so, so, uh, so as much as in me is, I am what? Ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Okay? So we could also say have faith not only in the message, but also in what? You need to understand, God entrusted you with this task. Christ is not here today on earth going up to people and saying, hey, have you believed in me yet? Okay? He hasn't done that. He's tasked us as ambassadors in his stead with that, with that function, right? So the first way to deal with fear is faith in the message and in yourself as the what? Messenger. Not because you're so great and I'm so great and we always do everything right, but because God trusts us to be the messenger. You need to think about that. God trusts us in the dispensation of grace to be his messenger in earth, um, in, er, in the earth. Okay? So if he has confidence and trust, now why does he trust you and me? Because we just get to come up with the message? No. Because we believe the message, we understand the message, and then once we understand that, we become messengers of that what? Message, right? So Romans 1 15, <coughs> you, me, we already have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to take it what? Personally and seriously, right? Appreciate who God has made us in Christ. We're saints, we've, we're forgiven, we're redeemed, and we're ambassadors. God trusts us as saints with this task. Now, God only knows why. It would seem to be much more effective if he would just appear to people and, and so on and so forth, but that's not the way he chose to do it in the dispensation of grace. Okay? Any questions about that? Just on, on 15, it would seem like that when he's talking about the gospel, he's talking more than salvation because he's writing to save people. Right? I think in the context, he, he's referring to more than that as well. Because he says in, earlier on in verse um, 11, he says, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be what? Established. Well, we know at the, end of chapter, uh, at the end of Romans, well, how does one get established? They get established by my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and an understanding of the scripture of the what? Of the prophets, right? So, yeah, he's got faith in the message, and Paul has confidence in, in himself as a messenger, not because of his own flesh and his own ability and his own, you know, dynamic uh, or whatever, but because he understands that that message has got a hold of him, that God has entrusted him to be the what? The messenger. Okay? Anybody else? E. Equipping. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. <coughs> Mastering the critical issues of the gospel and always remembering that the power of God and the salvation is not in you, it's in that message. Okay? You Think about this, okay? Do you already know more than a lost person does? You, you might think you don't know much, but do you know more than them? Okay. Go to 1 Corinthians 3 quick. First Corinthians 3. Verse, verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers? By whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave what? Okay. So, we only plant and water. The humans involved in this, 
these us as messengers, we only plant and water, right? That's all we do. We sow the seed and we water the seed that's there. Who gives the increase? God does. Okay? Because again, the power of God and salvation is not in you and me. I've got a book at home. I, I, actually, I, don't, I misplaced it. I've got to try to find it. But the name of the book is Why Good Arguments Fail. Okay? You've got to understand that you can have the best argument. You can have the best presentation. You can have every dot, every I dotted, every T crossed of your doctrine. You can be precise and straight up and go right down the line and have somebody tell you no. Okay? Because what you're dealing with is the heart of that what? That person. Okay? So the second key to overcoming faith is, uh, is, th is through equipping. Mastering the critical issues of the gospel. I'm going to do a whole study just on that issue, okay? Mastering the critical issues of the gospel and remembering that the power is in the message, not in you. It's not in me. It's in that gospel. It's in that message. It's in that truth, right? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God, right? The Word of God is what is going to have the capacity and the power and the life to save that person eternally, right? And you already know more than they do as a believer, okay? So you already know more than that lost person does. So what? see, what's going to happen, and I forget who, poor approach, different, th what's going to happen is people are going to try to distract you off the main issue. And if you let them, that's your fault, <laughs> okay? They're going to try to distract you off the main issue. Here's one I love. Well, what about the guy in the jungle who's never heard? <laughs> well, what about that guy? I'm not talking about that guy. I'm talking about you. Right? Now, that's a question that we can, t that we can deal with later on. But that is an avoidance tactic. That is something somebody says out of their own sense of justice to try to avoid and escape accountability. We're not talking about that guy. We're talking about you. Right? That is, so we got to keep the issue the issue. We got to have a, a, our eyes firmly fixed on what the issues are and what the central critical issues of the gospel are. Verse 8 Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own what? Labor. All we do is plant and water. Who gives the increase? God does. God's word in the heart and the mind of that person is going to what is going to what is going to convict and create the increase within that person. Okay. Any questions about equipping? Okay. If there's not, a it's action. Taking action is the key to overcoming fear. Come to 1 Thessalonians 2. Have you ever watched a, a baby learn to walk? Okay. They get strong enough where they can stand up, right? And then what do they do? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> right? And eventually they overcome whatever that is and they what? They take, a step. they take a step, right? And the first time they probably fall over and cry and scream and everything else, right? Okay? But the point is, you're never going to learn to walk if you don't take the first what? Okay. Step, right? This isn't Taoism where we got action by inaction. You know, never mind. <laughs> That's what Taoism teaches, right? That you can have action by inaction. I can just sit here and do nothing and this is action according to that philosophy, right? That's not, that's not the way Paul puts it to the church, the body of Christ. The first, the first one of the steps in overcoming fear is by simply taking what? Action. You understand that? When I, when I, well, I'll give you another illustration. When I was playing Little League at first, I was scared to death that I was going to get hit by the ball when I was batting. That the pitcher was going to hit me and so on. Okay? 
So if you let that fear of getting hit stop you from batting, are you going to be much good at baseball? No. No. <laughs> You're not, right? You got to stand up there and you got to, are you running the risk that you might get hit with the ball? Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to play, do you have to take that action? Do you have to take that step? I still think, you can disagree with me if you want to, I still think one of the craziest things that anybody does in professional sports is to stand 60 feet, 6 inches away from somebody with a rock throwing it at them 100 miles an hour. And, and with a, just a little helmet on your head, expecting that, I mean, that's just crazy to me. Okay, but that's what they do. That's, you go to the Tigers game, you go to the Cubs game, that's what those guys are doing, right? You got a guy like Verlander who's bringing in at 101, and what do you, you literally have a nanosecond to decide what you're going to do, right? That, I mean, that's how much time you have to decide, right? That's crazy, right? But if you let your fear of getting hit stop you, are you ever going to be able to play? No. So one of the first ways to overcoming that fear is just to stand there. Right? Seems to me this is consistent with some other stuff Paul says, right? In Ephesians 6, he talks about standing. Having done all to what? Stand. Right? So, the, so action. Sec, or where did I tell you to go? 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians 2, verse 1. <coughs> For yourselves know, brethren, our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that ye even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. How did it go for Paul at Philippi? Not very good. Right? So here he is now at the next city. And what does he do? Would it have been very easy for him to say, nuts to this, I'm not doing this anymore. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to jail. Would have been easy, right? But what's he say in verse 2? But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know. Now, did Paul literally have negative response? To his physical detriment. Okay? Did he have personal rejection? Did he have a lot of this, this stuff happen to him, right? So how did he keep going? He kept going by just taking what? The next step. He just took action. Lee? Years ago, I went for quite a while with Campus Crusade. Campus Crusade. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think once you get somebody engaged in conversation, you can... Just starting is the hardest thing, right? It's like starting your car on a cold morning. Right? You get out there and your car's like, dude, it's too cold. And you're like, dude, it's too cold, but we got to do this together, right? So you, you, you let it have it and it turns over and eventually that car warms up and it's what? It's running, right? It's the same thing with conversation. <laughs> It is. I might get somebody starting a conversation about the Cubs, which is fine. Is there anything sinful about talking? Unless you're a Tiger fan, is there anything sinful about talking about the Cubs? No. No. Okay. But my objective is not ultimately to talk about the Cubs. My objective is to talk about something else. Right. And if I have to start talking to him about the Cubs to lead the conversation to Christ, see, I picked the Cubs because it starts with a C, <laughs> and Christ starts with a C. Okay, they're a very spiritual team to root for, by the way. Okay, that no, the Cardinals are not. 
Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, okay, I'm joking. But you, you, so, but you understand, right? You can talk, you start talking to somebody about something and know in your mind that you really want to bring them to talking about this. So the way you're going to bring them to talking about this is getting them started on this. Icebreaker. Icebreaker. Breaking the ice. Breaking the sound barrier like Lee's talking about. Right? And maybe it's going to take me two times talking to this person to get to that point. But if I don't take action at all, I may never what? See, I think, and I think you have to think strategically, right? Are there some people in your life that you are going to have to see, work with, and deal with daily? Every day. The guy next to you on the line, the guy next to you in the next classroom, the guy wherever, right? The, 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 the woman that, that, that's, you know, you, that you see every day when you drop your kids off, whatever it is, right? So those people you might take a different approach with than the person you meet one time in Meyer who you never know if you're going to see him again. Now, I will be honest with you. When I go in Meyer, and maybe this is my own issue, I'm not, when I go in Meyer, I'm looking to get what I'm there to get and to get out. I'm not going into Meyer looking for, you know, to spend the whole day preaching on a corner in Meyer. Okay? Maybe that's, maybe I have something I need to think through on that. I don't know. Okay? But you understand what I'm saying, right? It starts with what? Action, okay, and then the R is for a reason. <laughs> Go to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, look at verse 18. The writer of Proverbs says, where there is no vision, the people what? Perish. Perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Without a, if you have a reason for doing something, you can do anything. If you have a good reason for doing it. Okay? Paul talks about, for God is not, uh, why don't I have that verse written down here? For God hath not given us the, for God hath got, not given us the spirit of fear, but of what? Power and of love and what? Sound mind. I don't even know why I don't have that written down here, but think about each one of those. So he's not giving you fear, he's giving you what? Power. The first thing he's giving you is power, right? We have absolute confidence in our message. Where's the power? Message. The power of God is on the salvation in the gospel of Christ. Right? Number two, love. Come to Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. So, he's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. The second one, love. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Do you understand that? No, do, you, do you understand that no other religion has a statement like that? None. No other, no other truth, so-called truth system has in it the idea that, hey, when you were my enemy, I loved you enough that I was going to what? Die for you. Okay? But God commendeth his love. So how did God commend his love? How did God demonstrate his love? The love of God is demonstrated towards us that he died for our sin, right? That even while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Christ died for us. How are we doing on time? Yeah, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Uh, come over to 2 Corinthians 5. <coughs> what, ought to, what, what constrains you? What motivates you? 
The love of Christ, right? So Christ demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Now that love, that great love wherewith he loved us is supposed to be the thing that motivates and constrains us, right? Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we th thus judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead. For that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died, but unto him which died for them and what? Rose again. Right? So he's got, Paul says he's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of power. Power is the absolute confidence that we have in our message. Love, love is the love of Christ constraining us. Okay? And number three, he says, power, love, and sound what? Mind. mind. You know what a sound mind is able to do? Okay? A sound mind is able and has the capacity to distinguish between our personal identity and rejection of our message. People are rejecting the message, but it feels like they're rejecting you. Right? A sound mind is able to discern between rejection of the message and rejection of the person. Okay? So sound mind is the ability to distinguish between our personal identity and the rejection of our message. We know, we understand what is really going on. We understand that the sinner is not liking the fact now you're coming along and saying to them, hey, buddy, you've got a what? <laughs> you've got a problem. Your problem is such that you cannot save yourself. Will God accept your own works, your own performance? He will not. What will he accept? He will accept faith in the work of his son who did it all for you. Will you receive salvation as a free gift? Now, I don't want that. You're crazy. You're a loon. Go on. Go bother somebody else. They don't like me. So what we need, so part of this is part of this is having a reason. Okay? Why are we doing what we're doing? Well, maybe one reason is because God told us we're ambassadors. That's probably maybe an important reason, okay? But number two, we we see we need to see the world through the light, the way God sees the world. And the way God sees the world is people who are in Adam and people who are where? In Christ. In Christ. God sees all the world without distinction. Okay? He doesn't see man and woman. He doesn't see uh, uh, socioeconomics. He doesn't see skin color. He doesn't see race. He doesn't see any of that stuff. He sees a bunch of sinners out there that are equally sinners, regardless of where they came from, for whom Christ what? Died. And what God wants to do with every nationality, every group, every whatever, is take those dead, lost sinners in Adam and put them in who? Christ. Christ. And how does that get accomplished? That gets accomplished by believing and trusting in the finished work of who? Christ. Christ. And when that message is believed, when that gospel is believed, the result is that person is now a member of the body of Christ and is now in Christ. Okay? So we've got... We need to understand that fear is the biggest thing that stops us. Sometimes fear is rational. Fear can be a sin. Fear is going to be constant. How are we going to deal with it? We're going to deal with it through faith in the message, equipping. We'll start talking about that next. Action, and then what? The reason for doing what we're doing. Okay? So we have a few minutes left. I don't have anything else um, necessarily in the notes specifically that I want to say. So does anybody have any questions or comments? Fred? Uh, just a couple comments and additions, I guess, to passages that you were reading before. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, you, you had that passage. Uh, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. I think one of the 
problems or negative, you know, one of the reasons over here we could add to maybe is uh, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll put it off for tomorrow, you know. Uh, rise from the sleep. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I know I, I know I need to talk to that person, but uh, I'll wait for for a better time. Uh, the other thing it was in First Thessalonians, you had that passage in chapter two. Uh, if you go on down to verse four, there it says, "But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, it's a privilege." that God has given us, you know, you were saying, why did God choose to use us? Mm -hmm. well, Read the rest of that verse too, Fred. Pardon me? Read the rest of verse 4. Yeah, uh, even, <coughs> uh, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. In other words, what you're saying is that we don't worry about what, whether or not what we do is going to be acceptable to man, but we're doing it for us to please God. You know, I wonder sometimes, I appreciate that insight, Fred. I wonder sometimes if American believers have a particularly hard time with this given the comparative affluence of our culture with other parts of the world. So in other words, do we perceive ourselves as having more to lose? in this by not witness, by not sharing Christ than if we maybe live somewhere else in the world. I don't know. Um, it's interesting how I, I, I do believe that the adversary is a wily individual and that he will use whatever the uh, prevailing winds are within a society and a culture against that society and culture. Okay? Nate? Well, on that point, I think uh, with your someone else will do it, it's easy not to say anything. It's easy. And I think that's the message out there nowadays if you watch social media. If you say something, it's going to get really hard for you really fast. You know, to the point where they question your sanity, your Christianity, your, your message, anything. It's easier to just sit there and watch and not say anything. And that's... That's the idea that's reinforced over and over and over. It's just don't say anything, make it easy on yourself, and just live your life and go. Uh -huh. Lee? I was going to say back to the uh, breaking the sound burner. I used to, when I was doing door to door work, total strangers, if I was knocking on the door and could get in the house, I used to have a little outline that I followed, F-O-R-M. I used to, I didn't get me to break the barrier by starting talking about family. O for occupation. R, religious background. And there I would usually ask the question to you, who is Jesus Christ? And then finally, M is the message. So you, you're already on a roll. And it opens the door lots of times. Well, I'm, I'm going to write that down. What was that? F -O -R -M. The F was for what? Family. Family. Occupation. And religion. Religion. Religious background. People will do that, by the way. People are only too happy. You, you realize that in our culture right now, it's cool to be spiritual. With a small s. Just as long as it's got nothing to do with the God of the Bible, people are okay with it. And what was the M? Message? Now see that, that, that right there, again, that's a practical thing. Can you get people to talk about their family? Are they only too happy to tell you what they do? Okay. Are they willing to tell you every goofy thing they believe? Okay. Oh yeah, they are. So if you have to go through that to get to that, is that the worst thing that ever happened in the world? As long as they got that. No. 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 I would. I can't spell right, so I'd write S in here.